In the last lecture, we started to talk about selection theory in general. Um, and to remind you why we care, one of the overarching questions of this course are, what are the basic ways in which we think about evolution? How do we generalize evolution? How do we then begin to use those general ideas of evolution um, to understand the origins of life? Um, and as you'll remember from last time, we introduced this concept of a fitness landscape where we're thinking about all of the different sequences that can exist in a genome. Um, the last time we talked about this in the simple zeros and ones. And then we talked about how each of these um, individual sequences has a distinct fitness associated with it. Um, and we also introduced this idea that for each position of the sequence, we're thinking about some sort of um, high dimensional um, cube, some sort of hypercube um, that links together all of these different sequences um, in some sequence space and how you can move one from another. Um, the other main concept we introduced last time um, was this idea of the quasi-species equation. Um, and this is a simple way to describe the rates of change, of change in the abundance of each of these distinct sequences. So this is d x sub i dt um, equals this complicated sum relating the current abundance x sub j to the current fitness of that x sub j um, and then some mutation rate q from species j into species i minus an average fitness times the current abundance of x sub i. Um, where this average fitness is defined as the summation um, x sub i times f sub i. Um, again, remembering that x sub i, um, these individual sequences, um, are all frequencies. So they all sum to one, um, and this is how we come to have this average fitness. In this lecture, what we want to do is actually take these set of equations um, and start to make meaningful biological predictions out of them. Um, start to understand what happens to populations um, of competing um, sequences um, under these dynamics um, described by these equations. So the simplest way that we can do that um, is to think about a very reduced or simple case where we have a fitness landscape defined by a master sequence as it's often called. So this is just the most fit sequence um, away from which you might be able to mutate. Um, we call this F sub naught, um, competing against all other sequences that have an equal, uh, an equal fitness um, that are all the same. So really we have a two state model F sub naught and F sub one, and we're thinking about the dynamics of competition between all of these sequences and the master sequence. For the master sequence, we wanna say that its fitness F sub zero is greater than one, all other sequences have a fitness equal to one, and this gives us the simple dynamics. Again, we're gonna create a two state model where we just have mutation away from this F sub naught into all other sequences, um, and those are the dynamics that we'll consider. Now for these mutation rates, a simplifying assumption we can make is that um, we first want to consider how likely it is for um, the, the sequence to perfectly replicate itself, that is to replicate with no mutation. And what this should be is just one minus the pointwise mutation rate. This is just how likely it is for each one or zero in that sequence um, to change to a different number from a one to a zero. So it's the pointwise mutation rate of the entire sequence. And so the probability of F sub naught replicating perfectly is one minus this mutation rate um, raised to the L power, where L is the overall sequence length. So this is perfect replication where you just have one minus mu multiplied um, L times, giving us this simple relationship. Now considering that, the rate um, or the probability of mutating F sub naught to all other F sub ones um, is simply the likelihood that it didn't replicate perfectly. So this should just be one minus um, Q zero zero, one minus the perfect, um, the one minus the probability that the sequence replicated perfectly. And then we can consider that the probability of back mutation from all of the different um, F sub one sequences into the F sub zero sequence is zero. And this simply accounts for the fact that there are a huge number of F sub ones living on this complicated hypercube. And so the probability of a mutation that went out of F sub zero finding its way back is very low. Um, this is a simplifying assumption that's often made. Um, and then the probability of F sub one mutating into F sub one is of course one because it's not gonna mutate back in F sub zero for the same um, set of assumptions that we just mentioned, that I just mentioned. Now taking these together, we can couple these with this quasi-species equation um, again, remembering these two sets of equations. And once we do that, what we obtain is that d x sub zero dt, 
should be x naught f naught times q minus x naught times phi. And q, as you can see at the top right, is what we've defined this mutation, this uh, error-free replication of the master sequence back into the master sequence, one minus uh, u to the l. We're just calling that q for shorthand for the rest of this. Um, and so what's nice is that because we only have this two-state model, this complicated sum in the quasi-species equation um, becomes this simple equation for dx naught, um, where we're actually taking every term in the summation. Um, it's just because of the different zeros in the q's and because of two states, we get this simple um, subtraction of um, x sub naught f sub naught q minus x naught times phi. Similarly, the dynamics for dx sub one dt um, is written in this way, where again, we're taking every term um, in the summation at the top left. And phi also has a simple, simple relationship of it, just f sub naught x sub naught plus x sub one. So this is the fitness of the master sequence times its abundance plus um, the abundance frequency really um, for the, the all other sequences, again, which all have fitness one and so that term falls out. Now, if we take these three equations together and we recognize that x sub naught plus x sub one should equal one, that is all the frequencies must sum to one, then we can reduce all four of these equations into one simple equation um, that just gives us the dynamics for dx sub naught dt. So what is the rate of change of the master sequence in time? And what's nice about this is that we can now look um, for steady states. So we have a single equation that describes the overall dynamics of these two different sequences. Um, and we can set dx dt equal to zero and find this um, steady state solution for the master sequence, which simply equals uh, this ratio that you see in the middle of um, the screen. Um, and this is really nice because it tells us there's a simple steady state if we take time to infinity um, that the master sequence should achieve, and it depends on its own fitness along with this mutation rate Q, which really depends on how long the sequence is and what this pointwise mutation rate um, happens to be. What's also nice is that we can now set conditions for what happens to the master sequence. So notice that if f sub naught q was exactly equal to one, um, the master sequence would go to zero abundance. So if it had um, roughly the same um, fitness as all the other sequences, uh, it, it would uh, simply go to zero. Um, for it to have a positive abundance for x sub naught, for the steady state, x sub naught star to be greater than zero. This requires that um, its fitness times uh, this Q mutation rate must be greater than one. And if we take that a little bit farther, what we can do is rewrite this equation um, in terms of the original definition of Q. Um, it's convenient here to take the logarithm of both signs. And so then we get the simple relationship between the logarithm of fitness being greater than negative the sequence length times the logarithm of one minus this point mutation rate. Um, we can take some approximations for that log one minus this point mutation rate, assuming that mu is very small, in which case we find this approximate solution for how large that pointwise mutation rate can be. And we see that it must be less than the ratio of the logarithm of fitness divided by the length of the sequence. Now this is typically called the error threshold. Um, and what it means is that there's a maximum mutation rate that allows for adaptation in a complicated fitness space. And that maximum mutation rate depends on how long the overall sequence is um, and how, uh, how much fitter the master sequence is relative to all the other um, sequences. Um, and it should be noted here that if fitness of the master sequence increases, you don't get such a gain in this maximum mutation rate because of this logarithm. So logarithm of fitness grows very slowly with increasing fitness, um, whereas this mutation rate is much more sensitive um, to the overall frequency space. So this is this error threshold or error catastrophe as it's often called, um, really defines uh, the, the adaptive and mutational um, thresholds for all of life. Um, it's a commonly used concept and is generally obeyed for, by all the species um, that we know to exist. And in the next lecture, what we'll do is connect these ideas um, to a more chemical rather than um, sequence space evolution to show how these same set of equations um, help us understand um, that type of evolution.